All right, everyone, uh, just gonna get Pierre to join. Hey. Hey, Pierre. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. That was seamless. Yeah. Yeah. That was quick. Hey, it's good to see you. Likewise. Uh, how are you doing? I, uh, I'm i doing all right. I'm uh, in Houston visiting family. So I got, the, uh, I got the Frozen movie motif around me. I picked nice. like the one empty corner of the room. But I'm doing oh, really yeah. well. And yourself? Not too bad. Can't complain. Uh, yeah, nice weather finally for us. So looking mm. forward to getting out after. Yeah, it feels like it's taken a while to warm up. Uh, at least for us, yeah, it's been it's been strange, but uh, yeah. yeah, we'll take it when when it comes. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Cool. It's good to be on this call with you. Yeah, likewise, likewise. I'm actually looking forward to this. Not that I don't look forward to the other ones, but this one's uh, a bit different from the topics we've covered to, to date. Uh, yeah. So I'm hoping we can dive a bit deeper on this one. But yeah, really the topic around depression. And um, I guess for context, why did we choose this topic now? And I know you and I have chatted about it, but just yeah. for people viewing this why why depression and and why now yeah well in part it seemed like a natural offshoot from our discussion last uh last time around happiness and yeah. the experiences that define happiness or rather the mindset that defines happiness and and also the perhaps some of the circumstances in which uh, there are challenges to finding happiness, even despite your your greatest effort. And mm -hmm. so that naturally led to a discussion around major depression and how it shows up. And I think, too, it's sort of a, an interesting time to think about that uh, in part because there is a lot of a focus on uh, on mental health and mental health awareness this month. Uh, it's certainly something that uh, we've both had experiences personally and professionally with, and uh, one in which uh, there's quite a lot to know in particular around the ways in which depression shows up in particular for men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess there's an aspect with, with many of these mental health disorders, um, unfortunately, the terms get thrown around quite frequently, especially with social media now. And, and there's pros and cons to it. Obviously, there's a level of awareness that brings, which is great. But then there's also um, an opportunity for misdiagnosis or um, probably not using these terms in the most appropriate form. So from a clinical perspective, I think it's important to perhaps break down what depression is and what are some of the symptoms that uh, are prevailing when, when it comes to depression? Um, and, I, and I've listed some of them from the DSM-5. Yeah. But, um, Go for it. You want. Well, I think the biggest uh, <clears throat> piece that I found in, and I find more relevant is, is the prolonged nature of it. So there is a distinct uh, differentiation between sadness and, and depression. So sadness is normal we all experience it it's a normal emotion especially when we fall short of our expectations or, or things come at us from left field that we weren't expecting but i think the the difference here and i'll take a stab at it so please feel free to correct me later but there there is that uh excessive feeling of and, and those feelings can consist of worthlessness uh guilt um and then and then when at a prolonged uh, time frame, there's this diminished ability to think or concentrate or not being able to make decisions. Um, and, and you're kind of feeling that throughout the day or, or days and, and you're losing your ability to feel pleasure or, or any form of interest through some of the activities you may enjoy. Um, 
and, and then there's obviously the other aspect of it from a physical perspective where you're probably not engaging in movement, you're feeling fatigue, uh, you're probably spending a lot of time in bed or just not doing anything. And then on the excessive side, it is the uh, suicidal ideation and, and then those negative thoughts around kind of ending your life. So that's how, at least what I captured from, from the DSM-5 in terms of symptoms. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's an important differentiation. I think on top, it's more than just the sort of natural human experience of sadness. It's a cluster of of symptoms that uh, that includes an element of of change in mood. Usually, that's a dimin like a diminution in mood, a sadness, a lowness. Um, in some cases, that uh, that can show up as irritability, and sometimes with men, that that is uh, how the presentation emerges with a sense of irritability alongside uh, loss of pleasure or joy. Yes. And usually this sort of sense of depressed mood is kind of the cornerstone of, of the diagnosis. And it shows up with all of the, with many of the features that you've described. Those are all of the, the sort of the diagnostic criteria that show up in the, in the DSM. This change to sleep and interest and guilt and energy and concentration and appetite and movement and worthlessness or suicidal thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and important to note is a, a syndrome, in essence, this cluster of features uh, that shows up most of the time over a distinct period. And that, that period, according to the DSM, is uh, over two weeks. Now, important to know, that that is the the sort of cutoff for the diagnosis, but on average, a duration of major depression or an episode of major depression lasts somewhere between four and twelve months, mm -hmm. which is pretty remarkable. Uh, and a duration each episode untreated, and so while just sort of reading about major depression uh, might suggest that most of us who experience depression experience it on the order of weeks. It's in fact experienced on the order of uh, months. And given that so many people experience recurrent episodes, that's a pretty substantial period of any person's life. Mm -hmm. and so it's, mm -hmm. it, it, it really is a, a condition that impacts a substantial portion of the time on any given day but also of, uh, of any person's life over the duration. Yeah, <clears throat> and just to understand better, um, also for myself, is there, so, you, you know, you're talking about prolonged experience of weeks and, and perhaps spilling over into months. Is there, situ are there situations actually where you may come in and out of those, um, I guess, so? Uh, depressive feelings i would say like or or conditions where you know you, you maybe have a good few days and then you fall back into it and then you yeah. kind of keep going in and out is that very common because i think that is but i just want to get your thoughts on yeah it. it is actually very common i mean really the in looking at the sort of the way in which depression will show up at, over any extended period of time uh you can have periods of uh, of several days at a time of normalization of mood, but you're looking really at, at uh, most of the time for at least two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, different ways in which depression can be classified based on the structure of, or the, the sort of the, the nature of the symptoms. Um, but just a, a more sort of broad understanding of the condition is that it's not very homogeneous. It's, um, it is, you know, a condition with um, at least nine potential symptoms. And so you've got to have at least uh, 
four to five, depending on uh, whether you've got this sort of experience of sadness. And so you're looking really at any sort of one of a couple hundred combinations of potential symptoms. And we haven't even talked about some of the symptoms that are very common in men that aren't uh, that aren't uh, described within the DSM. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's pretty heterogeneous, which means that one person's experience of depression may not look exactly like another. Um, you may have periods of uh, improvement in mood and some fluctuation, uh, but by and large over the, the duration of time, um, the mood on most days for most of the time is down. And it mm -hmm. usually represents a fairly uh, distinct contrast from what your mood is like normally. Now, mm -hmm. that's not to say that it happens very quickly or that the drop in mood is very sudden. In fact, for many people, and this is true, especially in early fatherhood, the onset is very insidious. And my own experience of it was that it just happened so slowly that it seemed like a natural progression almost of personality. And that's often how it's described, especially in early fatherhood, that it's sort of this insidious change in personality. Mm. Um, and so just because um, we talk about it as a distinct change in mood doesn't necessarily mean that it's a sharp, sudden drop. Right. And so often it can be so subtle and so slow, we don't fully appreciate the change until you're a few days or weeks or months even into into an episode. Hmm. No, that's that's uh, great to explain that. I think, yeah, so it's almost like it creeps up on you and you're probably not aware of it. So, so yeah. So what, what do people do then in that situation where it's just to your point, it's a very slow and subtle change in your personality. Um, how do they become, first of all, aware of it and if they do become aware of it, what can they do? Um, yeah, well, and I think that fatherhood piece is definitely also important to, that we can get into after. Yeah, agreed. Well, I, I think for starters, uh, it's important to be able to, uh, to articulate the experience to other people, but it's helpful to have other people around you because you may not notice this sort of subtle change, but others might. Others might notice changes in willingness to interact, um, willingness to speak, uh, change to activity, uh, certainly uh, in many cases a change to general demeanor. Um, for men, that can sometimes show up with attacks of anger or irritability, uh, change to sense of confidence or self-worth. And, mm -hmm. and so it may not show up internally, or at least it may not set off alarms internally, uh, but other people around us might notice, hey, you're, you're you know, really taking a while, you're snappy, you're really irritable, um, and it's taken a while to make some simple decisions, um, and you may not feel so comfortable getting out of bed or, or moving around. So it's helpful to have other people to, uh, to sort of pick up on these, uh, on these uh, clues. The challenge is when you're the other person to sort of do that in a way that is loving and helpful and uh, and doesn't uh, contribute to a sense of guilt or shame that mm -hmm. tends to be already mounting, already fairly large in individuals who experience depression. So um, often that's a challenge, just that sort of level of interaction. Uh, yeah. For me, yeah, for me personally, I mean, I'm happy to sort of speak uh, to my own experience. Uh, but I start noticing that I feel like this weighted sensation and um, and heavy and like I'm dragging. And that's usually one of the first indicators of the onset of a depressive episode. So it's it's helpful sometimes just to be able to pick up on the cues the, yourself. Uh, but for me, that's taken a very long time. It's taken several recurrent episodes um, for me to pick up on that one particular yeah. clue. Yeah, no, what that's important. Yeah. Um, I would say very similar. I just want to, first of all, kind of build on what you said about people perhaps bringing it to your awareness. 
And I think there are cases where you obviously need to be able, able to trust what people are telling you. And as you pointed out, it needs to be coming from a place of love and compassion. And you have to be very careful because obviously there's a huge stigma around it. And um, I was in an experience where it wasn't brought up in a compassionate way. It was more of a shameful way, which didn't help uh, with the experience. It only made it worse. But uh, I guess for me too, yeah, I would agree. It, it took some time to pick up on the cues and becoming aware of them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, for me, it was almost a cycle where it almost, there was a feedback loop that kept reinforcing itself. So as you can appreciate as a high achieving individuals, when you're kind of going through those episodes, you're almost, for me, I'm not very productive. And that lack of productivity brings shame and guilt, which only makes the episodes worse. So one of the things I had to do was when I became more aware of it was giving myself permission to feel. Now, it, it was almost like an internal dialogue that, okay, if you want to feel this, whatever is going on, give yourself the two or three days of mm -hmm. grace and without any judgment on self. And sometimes it would take less time or sometimes it may drag on for a bit. But once I was able to give myself that permission, I was able to at least step out of that guilt and shame. And then the other piece was for me recognizing when, to your point, the cues, how the rumination would start and build on itself and trying to break that cycle, whether it was forcing myself to go for a walk or reading a book or doing something that would break me out of that cycle. Because I, I recognize that once I fell into that loop, I could just spend hours in it and it just made things worse. Now, that's obviously easier said than done. And for some people, it, to your point, it could take some time to become aware of those cues and patterns. But once you have some awareness, try to figure out ways on how you can break them. Uh, at least that was my experience. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes good sense. And it resonates for, for me as well. My very first experience with major depression, my first episode of major depression was in medical school. And so I had already uh, started and engaged in this process of um, very intense education and training and long hours. And I found myself really falling behind, unable mm -hmm. to concentrate, unable to really spend as much time uh, in preparation and studying. And, and as a result, I found myself struggling to stay afloat and really it was sort of the external productivity markers that brought it to the fore and I think that sometimes for men in particular that is the case that will be willing to and certainly my own experience is that I was willing to to sort of suck it up and just power through without seeking help until it started to impact my capacity to do, in essence, my job. Mm. And now I realize that that process is, is, doesn't serve me. It's not something that I need to do. In fact, it's something that I, I discourage. Uh, I think it's very, very helpful to be able to communicate the experience early, even if you uh, don't have you know, even if you're not necessarily looking for a solution, just being able to, to say, you know, this is what I'm experiencing right now and giving yourself the capacity, the time, the grace, the energy um, to, to receive the support either from other people or from yourself uh, to experience what you are without mm -hmm. necessarily exa exacerbating it by trying to stuff it down, which is certainly yeah. what, what happened to me and my own sort of, early approach to navigating a depressive episode was very much to power through and, and felt like it only added to the sense of um, stigma that I had around it, that somehow mm -hmm. it was a matter of powering through rather than just right. recognizing I was experiencing uh, an episode of an illness. Right. And it very much has 
for me become one of prevention and treatment, uh, just like any other. And so um, I now look at it in very different ways. Uh, and obviously, as someone who's treated depression, try to help others to do the same. But for me, the very first time that it happened, and even subsequent times, you know, I fell victim to my own sense of personal shame and stigma around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I like how you reframed it as an illness, because then it's, it's kind of normalizing it and being able to accept what it what it is and, and do something about it, mm -hmm. rather than avoiding it altogether. Did you find during the pandemic, if, if you experienced any episodes, that it was a bit tougher to deal with? Yeah, you know, it was different. Um, the normal the normal ways in which I might respond to it, particularly around interpersonal engagement and interaction, those a lot of those, you know, went away. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time there were there were some ways that made it a little bit easier. In many ways, um, the the sort of work from home situation also allowed uh, allowed for a little bit of flexibility around giving myself the room that I might need to take extra time if I needed it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And is that, so, sorry, you know, yeah. sorry to interrupt, just out of curiosity, is that because you are introverted? Um, maybe. I mean, to some extent, yeah, I think that that sort of a that can be a bit of a double edged sword, I suppose. In many ways, the my natural tendency is very much to to stay sort of uh, to to feel comfortable on my own and very uh, and to allow myself to replete on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, it does mean that. Yeah, it, it's a little extra hurdle to actually overcome that the inertia to interact socially. Yeah, and so I, I, I suppose it it was sort of a it can be a blessing and a curse in this in this regard. Um, yeah, yeah. No, but the, one re way the reason I why say, I ask. Yeah, yeah. First. Sorry, go ahead. No, uh, the one one of the the biggest reasons why during the pandemic it was a little bit like. One of the ways that it became a little easier was I also found myself interacting with people virtually much more. And while they couldn't necessarily call me out directly because they may not be seeing me, um, there is also a like a lowering of the, the barrier um, to let people know, hey, this is what's happening. Like it, it's almost like a sometimes when when I've experienced depressive episodes in the past, there's so much guilt and shame that it's hard for me to sort of feel comfortable just letting someone know face to face. And in this case, I could almost just let important people know, you know, I'm, I'm struggling and I, I really could use some support. I don't know exactly what that looks like right now. Mm -hmm. um, but just letting people know has, has allowed for you know, kind of thinking outside the box in terms of giving and receiving some support. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for me that that may be in part because I'm comfortable with the sort of introverted, um, it's the introversion and, and that sort of experience. I, I imagine it'd be a little different if I, was, if I were an extrovert. Yeah, yeah, no, I can yeah. speak to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear. Yeah, no, the reason why I asked because my experience was somewhat different because I'm I am extroverted so being stuck at home didn't really help whereas mm. in the past I may even if I experienced an episode I would be able to at least go out see people maybe go to the gym play sports whatever it is and not having those outlets really impacted me further so so I obviously from an extroversion side, I, I der drive energy from others. So not having that uh, definitely impacted me. Um, so, so that's why I asked. So I think yeah, being I aware of that. that can be, yeah, just being aware of it too, I think can be helpful knowing 
what kind of personality type you are and at least putting yourself in situations where you're not making it worse, I, I would suppose. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I think yeah, it might so be helpful to, to, to acknowledge some of the features. And I mentioned a little bit early on some of the features that may be more common to men. They're certainly not specific to men, uh, but there is some evidence to support the the greater likelihood for men to experience a kind of a small mix of features that are not represented in the the DSM yes. criteria, which adds to a layer of the potential under recognition of depression in men. And so before, perhaps before doing that, it's important to note that there's been a lot of research on on um, the experience, those sort of sex-based differences in the experience of major depression. And most of that research supports this very long-taught um, epidemiologic uh, fact, sort of factoid that, um, that women tend to experience depression about twice as commonly as men do. Um, and it's interesting. I think that uh, that there there are uh, there's a little bit of a resurgence in interest around how depression shows up based on sex, based on gender, and certainly mm -hmm. um, it, it'd be interesting to know more about that, especially these days as we see yeah. and, and look at um, gender in the with the the wider lens that it deserves. And um, and there are many reasons that this could be, but one of the potential confounds is that many men don't reach out for help, uh, don't acknowledge the experience of depression ourselves, uh, may not have the right or sort of the right quote unquote words for the depressive episode uh, the sort of symptoms of depressive episode. Um, the uh, thanks, Perry. I will I'll mention that. Um, but there is some evidence that that men experience this sort of combination of features uh, that has been dubbed male type depression. That includes a tendency toward feeling fatigued, uh, feeling drained, and describing the experience in those terms over uh, the description of sadness or depression, um, that we have a greater tendency to experience attacks of anger, restless mm -hmm. irritability, uh, a greater tendency to experience uh, self-doubt and self-diminution and to, to experience um, indecisiveness, particularly, particularly in early fatherhood. Um, right. And so that, maybe uh, worth noting, but also that we tend to, to have, uh, have a greater tendency to experience um, substance use, mm -hmm. externalizing behaviors, uh, perhaps in response to this feeling of numbness, uh, to reach out for use of substances, to engage in risky behaviors, risky sex or gambling. Um, and so many of those experiences may actually be part and parcel to the experience of major depression in men. And it's not really recognized as part of the DSM criteria, which means mm -hmm. that even um, you know, a mental health care uh, professional who's seeing a man who experiences those features but doesn't necessarily describe sadness or lost joy um, may not make the diagnosis of major depression. Uh, and there is also even some literature to suggest that um, that men who do come into a primary care office with the features of depression um, are less likely to receive a diagnosis and receive referral. And so there are lots of potential reasons that that two to one ratio may be exaggerated. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's also important to mention to Perry's point, Perry asked about episodic yeah. depression. Um, that's certainly something that I can speak to as well from personal experience. But generally, uh, 
most of us who experience major depression will experience recurrent episodes. Mm -hmm. So if someone experiences one episode of major depression, the likelihood of a second is 50%. Mm -hmm. After two, the likelihood for a third is about 75%. Mm -hmm. um, after three episodes, the likelihood for a fourth is about 90%. And it goes up. And so I, you know, I've, um, sort of, unfortunately, sort of lost track of the number of depressive episodes that I've experienced, which means I have to sort of, I have to, uh, but it's certainly more than five, but yeah. I have to essentially account for the, the near 100% likelihood that I will experience another one. Mm -hmm. And so even that bit of knowledge, I think, can help people to appreciate how to plan forward mm -hmm. because that's really important. A big question often emerges around, you know, if I'm in treatment, should I stay in treatment? How long should I stay on this medication? How long should I stay in psychotherapy? Well, if it's for the management of major depression and it's been a recurrent episodic depression, um, then that bit of data uh, might help you to make that determination for yourself. For me, it mm -hmm. means, in indefinite engagement in treatment. Right, right. No, thanks for sharing all that. And I guess, so, you know, for people that, I guess the, the struggle then becomes, do you want to be able to avoid it altogether? Or, or I think if there's an aspect of understanding that sometimes it can go unnoticed to your point, because it's very subtle or untreated. So there should be no like doom and gloom from that either. Um, but seeking out help and, and therapy at the right time, I guess, once you become aware. Yeah. Once you become aware, the sooner the better. I mean, research suggests yeah. the sooner you get help of any sort, the, the better. And, you know, there's been, I think, all kinds of information, misinformation about the, the value or lack thereof of many different modalities of treatment, uh, but most support engagement in psychotherapy uh, and medications if, uh, if someone is comfortable with, you know, and that's a very personal thing, I will say. Mm -hmm. For me, it is, um, it is super important to stay on my medications. I've been on and off medications historically and found myself falling into this sort of trap of doing well and saying, um, you know, maybe I don't need this anymore, only to discover that it's a it's very much a part of maintaining recovery um, and reducing uh, the likelihood of uh, more severe episodes uh, and recurrence or longer episodes. Um, but it's very much a, an important conversation that is personal and um, and important to have between an individual and a mental health practitioner, mental health professional. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That can include psychotherapy. It can also include things like um, uh, like proper nutrition, uh, physical activity, ensuring that you're checking uh, your physical health, looking for any indicators of contribution to depressive episodes. That might include things like a sun lamp if you live in a place in which... Um, in which uh, sunlight is uh, scarce, particularly in the fall and winter. Yeah. So it's pretty varied. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do want to acknowledge what uh, Future Threat said um, around the fear of the judgment, right? And we talked about it earlier often. Uh, you know, if people will bring it to your awareness and it's how it's brought to your awareness. And mm -hmm. yeah, if, if it's if it's almost judgmental, then there is that tendency to hide it. And yeah. I think what you mentioned earlier appears seeking that help out and perhaps even understanding who are you surrounding yourself with, right? And that's a different conversation altogether. But those are things I've had to look at as well. Like often, yeah. you know, you're a product of who you surround yourself with and and that's very common. So being aware of that too, um, there, there could be people that are bringing you down as well. 
and it's probably not helpful in those situations. Yeah, it is. It is really important. I think, especially since our thoughts are so frequently distorted in the throes of a depressive episode that there's already this sense of negativity or pessimism, self-doubt and guilt, Mm -hmm. questioning oneself, uh, that we can almost experience this state, and certainly I have, of uh, almost feeling like I deserve to be diminished. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and those are the times in which it can be quite problematic to be surrounded by people who are judgmental or not supportive. And those are really the times to reach out to people uh, in whom you find safety and compassion and empathy and the capacity to be heard. And sometimes that does require going outside of our sort of inner circle of people, um, which can be really challenging. Yes, for sure, for sure. Um, Another thing I wanted to expand on that you mentioned was, excuse me, uh, seeking out physical activity. And um, that's, I do want to highlight that I did talk to someone, it must be a year ago now, but they said, yeah, the common response to depression is, okay, well, go do exercise or physical activity. Mm -hmm. But what they started experiencing was anxiety. So having that awareness too, that maybe there are things that can, yeah, can improve with depression, but it can have certain other side effects. So I did want to highlight that. Yeah, Yeah. that's important. It feels like everything is, is this discussion of uh, risk and benefit. I mean, really everything. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and even, I mean, I find for me that having experienced a lot of, uh, a lot of thoughts and distortions around uh, around weight and food and body image historically, that gets exacerbated by depressive episodes. And so if I mm-hmm. find myself, you know, really outside of, uh, of the range of being in, in kind of uh, in the gym as regularly as I want, and then I suddenly go back, you know, I might, I might be, I might have this tendency to judge myself for not being able to do what I have done or what I had done historically. And I think one of the important things is in any inter, in any sort of response to a depressive episode, to be able to kind of give yourself a little bit of grace to recognize nothing is going to have an immediate, uh, an immediate sort of all together turnaround kind of response that things will need some ramping up Mm -hmm. that it will require some patience that's true with medications it's true with therapy it's true with physical activity and nutrition and i think that's one of the challenges around the treatment of depression too staying in the staying in the race it's very much a marathon Um, and so it's important to be able to recognize that if you are starting a medication or starting therapy or engaging in physical activity or changing your nutrition that um, even if you feel the same way in one week or two weeks, um, that it doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that um, it, it, you know, and, but it's so easy to fold that back into this rhetoric of self judgment and self doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And, and as we come, like, we're obviously getting close on time. Oh yeah. But yeah. I I do want to understand further because I tried to formulate it in a way in terms of where does it initiate, at least for me, but it it often revolves around some form of disappointment because we have these expectations on almost a daily basis down to everything we do. And for me, it was almost initiated by some level of disappointment. And Mm. that disappointment would then trigger those thoughts and how I would react to them. And there's a level of resilience I think you need. And one of the uh, models I came across was, uh, I've got it in front of me here, Martin Seligman's research on resilience, where he talks about personalization, permanence, and um, 
pervasiveness. Mm -hmm. So quite often we will then personalize a situation and, and that's where that rumination starts and those thoughts occur. And then the permanence where we tell ourselves that, Hey, this is, this is going to happen to me forever or whatever it is, right. Rather than assigning a shorter time frame and the pervasiveness, those negative thoughts mm -hmm. that continue to, to cycle around. What are your thoughts on that? That's interesting. I mean, in many ways, it's sort of like a quick view of the ways in which you can look at the cognitive distortions that might come up for you in the face of disappointment that might perpetuate or propel forward a depressive episode. I, I would say that, again, I'm going to sort of uh, perhaps reemphasize how heterogeneous the condition is. How, yeah. uh, how also, how s so much research supports uh, the neurologic basis, the genetic basis around the experience of major depression. Um, I think it would be very hard to sort of whittle it down to kind of one common experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. That said, it is also various. It is also very stereotypic, which means from from the standpoint of any one person, the experience of recurrent episodes tends to be, there tend to be some common through lines in them. And so it may be that past experiences will help to inform you about future ones, will help to inform you about how to detect or prevent, um, or at least help stop perpetuate uh, recurrent episodes. Mm -hmm. um, but I know for me, you know, I think, I look at growing up and seeing family members and definitely see this through line of, um, of the experience of depression uh, and how it's shown up genetically, um, how it's shown up from one generation to another. Uh, and so, you know, it shows up very differently than among family members who share um, some common genetics. and. I think again that kind of speaks to the that speaks to the the major differences from person to person um, for this very complex condition. Um, mm -hmm. But I notice for me um, one thing that I, that I do notice in terms of a pattern for me um, has been around timing. May is a particularly mm -hmm. difficult time. If Perry's still on this, we hopped on a live. Uh, uh, about a, a little over a week ago around a shared experience of losing uh, a loved one to, to suicide um, and, you know, surviving, um, surviving that loss. And for me that, you know, the, the sort of time of year and anniversaries around major losses tend to be um, a time of, uh, of higher risk. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, that, you know, that becomes really interesting just to think about from person to person. What do you notice most? How do you notice the sort of progression of symptoms? Is there something that happens? Certainly experiences in life, like loss, like missed opportunity or missed expectation. Um, those tend to be the, the kind of stressors that would promote the onset of a depressive episode. But we know that there are uh, sort of underlying features in terms of uh, neurochemistry, neurophysiology, um, genetics that might predispose any of us to the experience mm -hmm. of depression in those episodes. Yeah, no, no, that's great. Thanks, Pierre. I think it's important to at least understand the patterns. So then to your point, you're aware of it and you, you can have some sort of uh, proactive way of dealing with it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, this has I think been we're, terrific. Yeah, no, this has been great. Thank you, Pierre, for sharing your own Thank experiences you. and being so open and and vulnerable about it and kind of breaking it down. I think it's important to understand some of the, the the common symptoms, but also being able to identify that perhaps there are other symptoms that we may not be aware of and can go undetected, and and even the fact that this can come in in a subtle way and all of a sudden creep up on us that we may not appreciate. And, and then the last piece is being open about it and seeking help rather than 
trying to deal with it alone. That's that's probably the biggest piece, at least from my perspective. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Paul. Any final thoughts? Um, no, you know, I think uh, I think my final thought would be an encouragement to any might um, to people at large who might be listening who may be experiencing. Uh, what they think is depression or they know is depression to to let someone know and someone they they trust um, yes sometimes it's often just as easy as letting letting one person in um, and i I think that becomes it sort of builds upon itself. It was perhaps the hardest thing the very first time that I experienced depression looking back to let even one person know. But it mm. well, it became then a cascade where it was easier the next time and easier the time after that. And so I, I'd say that would be my, my final bit of encouragement here. Yeah, yeah. And I guess for people that are on the receiving end of that information, to, mm. to receive it with compassion and, and grace and perhaps manage that judgment, right? Because for, for someone to open up and be vulnerable, it, it takes a lot especially to share something like that. So there, you know, with anything like this, I believe the responsibility sits with both people. So being aware of that as well. Yeah, that's just said. Cool. Thank you so much for hosting. Yeah, no, um, thank you. Good to this see you. Great. Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, and that's a great addition there by Perry. Um, if you do suspect someone is just depressed to ask with compassion as well ah, yes, rather indeed. than judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Great. Thank you. Well, all. we'll do another one in a couple of weeks, but thanks for everyone that tuned in. We'll be posting this after the fact. So if anyone missed it, they can catch the whole thing, but yeah, Pierre, as always great conversation and thank you for yeah. sharing. Thank you for coming. Bye everyone. All right. Take care.